thank you so much. Our emphasis for this class on Marcia Gale is her publication, Dawn Over Mount Herod. And I'll be doing a lot of reading as you, some of you must know, I've always prepared a paper so that I don't waste your time doing Oz and what did I mean to say there. So everything is written down. And uh, I usually hand it to Neda at the end via email to anybody who wants a paper copy of what I have to share, regardless of what the class is. So Dawn Over Mount Hera and other essays is what this book is all about. Marzia Gale wrote it in 1976. She has divided the book into seven sections. She's titled all seven sections. The seven sections comprise 30, well, actually 28 essays, one poem called The Carmel Monks, her theme being the Christian monks in the Holy Land who were expecting the return of Christ. And the 30th is a translation of the sayings of Ali. And that, of course, is Ali, the son-in-law of the prophet Muhammad, the husband of his beloved daughter, Fatima, who is the leading female of the Muslim dispensation. And in, eventually, he took his rightful place as the first imam and the successor to his father-in-law, Muhammad. So to say a little bit more about the book itself, Marzia was 68 years old when she published it, and it covers a 40-year period of her writing. The earliest work of the 40 is from 1929, when she was only 21 years old. The latest of what we'll study is 1971, when she was 63. So she actually died five years after the last copied essay for this Dawn Over Mount Hera. There are many other essays that she has written. Uh, I should say that 28 of these essays, no, here it is. 22 of the essays are copied from her putting it, offering it to various volumes of the Baha'i world. Then seven of the essays that we will read are from the Star of the West. So she was always writing for talks, for books, and particularly for these essays. And then one that is in this book is from a publication in India. So we have 30 and we're not gonna cover them all, but I hope between now and the next session, everyone will be anxious to read the book Dawn Over Mount Hera themselves. Uh, I've had it for years and I keep picking it up and reviewing what she says. She's a brilliant writer and we will witness in our class today how she takes us on her journey of letting us picture what she has to convey about history, about personalities, be them believers of Baha'u'llah or not. We know that Marzia Gale and her brother are products of the first Baha'i East and West marriage. Her father was a diplomat. He served in under three different American presidents, Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson. She died in 1993 at 85 years old. Her father is Florence Breed was, Florence Breed Khan. She was a social hostess, much traveled, 
and very active in serving the faith of Baha'u'llah. Of these seven sections, we will cover this first session, sections one through four. Section one has the same title as the book, Dawn Over Mount Hera. And here's where I begin all my reading. So please be patient with me. A cave, Mount Hera is a cave on a mountain where Muhammad reportedly received his revelation from the angel Gabriel, representing Allah. Marcia gives the reader, especially one of Christian background, and this is brilliant, a humanistic view of Muhammad. Her narrative reminds one of Christ walking among the people, offering the choice wine that would change their hearts in that decadent period of the time in which Muhammad came. He took a lot of abuses and suffered greatly in return for his services at that time, representing Allah for humanity. His ministry is much greater than Jesus, and Christians, unfortunately, have a warlike vision of Muhammad. In these essays, she gives this, like I say, humanistic vision. You think of Christ when you're reading what um, Marzia Gale is saying about Muhammad. Of course, he could replicate the spiritual personality of Christ and he could suffer longer because his ministry was so much longer than Christ. We know that Christ's ministry was only three years. And we know the stories from the Bible of what he suffered and his sweetness. Muhammad received the message from angel Gabriel in 610. And Muhammad died in 632. So his ministry was 22 years and he endured much suffering, included being poisoned. Marzia smoothly offers a mere version of witnessing those cruelties. No wonder that Muhammad exclaimed, no prophet has ever suffered as I. The narrative is both scholarly compiled and composed and beautifully and simply written. The Christian view, as I said, of a warlike prophet is replaced with a kind and compassionate apostle of God. She writes everything so beautifully. You have to open up your spiritual eyes and picture, whether it's this essay or the other essays we will cover. So these are her words. I'll read just some of them. Muhammad never first withdrew his hand out of another man's palm, nor turned away before the other had turned. He visited the sick. He followed any bearer he met. He accepted the invitation of a slave to come to his house for dinner. His food was very simple, dates, water, barley bread. He mended his own clothes and sandals and milked the goats and wiped sweat from the horse with his sleeve. He gave alms when he had anything to give. Men said he was more modest than a virgin behind her curtain. Those who came near to him loved him. This is what makes me think he's now feeling to me like a Christ figure. His countenance shone like a majestic radiance, at the same time impressive and gentle. A lover, a follower said of him, I never saw anything more beautiful than Lord Muhammad. You might say the sun was moving in his face. 
The talent of Marzia Gale is just overwhelming and easy to recognize in this book. The second essay is called, the second essay of the first section is called Sadi's Garden of Roses. Of course, Sadi is a Persian poet and prose writer during the medieval period, about the 13th century. He is recognized for the quality of his writing and for the depth, the depth of his social and moral thoughts. Marzia records two and a half pages of sharp gems from Sadi's pen. I love the first story she tells. Uh, some of you may have been familiar with it, but I was not till I read this book. She writes a story of a king who had a slave and they went on a ship. The slave is weeping and crying out. He's afraid of the ocean. The king asked a wise man who was also on the ship for advice as how to quiet this Persian slave down. The sage advises the king to throw the slave overboard. This is done and it leads to the drowning man clinging to the ship. After being rescued, the slave sits quietly in a corner. What wisdom is this, asks the king. The wise man explains that the slave did not know what drowning was all about and thus did not value the safety of the ship. How simple. The last essay from section one, the last essays from this first section is the one on Ali and from the sayings of Ali, which is her translation. In words of simplicity, Marzia gives us a brief picture of the nation, nature and station of Ali. And we know, I said before, the son-in-law of Muhammad, the husband of Fatima, and eventually the first Imam and the successor to Muhammad. The next two pages are Marzia's translation of 40 of Ali's saying. I'd like to read them all, but you'll have the pleasure of doing it yourself. I have chosen four just to convey in this talk. The hypocrite has a sweet tongue, but a bitter heart. It is not, it is better not to sin and to beg for forgiveness. This is my favorite. Ask not who is the speaker. Ask what is the speech. And this well-known one, the miser is the banker of his heirs. The fact that she talks about Mohammed having his true successor as Ali, as the first imam, brought to mind that my library has a new book about that thick called The Caliph and the Imams. I always look at those books and check out the index. Ta yeah, the index. Table of con contents is in the front. The index is in the back. Okay, I checked the index and it had three references for Baha'i faith. So I looked up all three and they all said the same thing. Baha'is are heretics, Baha'is are heretics, Baha'is are heretics. That was all they said in this book. I don't have to read that book. I've already known that. Okay, we're going to jump to section two, which Marzia has titled, Take the Gentle Path. The first essay is called, There Was Wine. Listen to the first paragraph of this essay. I was immediately captured to carefully meet, read further. Some men love women and some men love money and some love fame. 
One can judge a man by what he loves. There is one type of man who loves a certain presence moving in his heart, a presence which he calls God. This type of man has always enriched his fellows. And when he dies, the flowers are a little fresher over him and other men come and sit by his grave and remember what he was. Who would write that? Oh, he died and he made an impact on other men. Oh, he died and he had a lot of flowers on his grave. The flowers are a little fresher over him. And other men come and sit by his grave and remember what he was. Marcia is speaking of Englishman George Herbert. Herbert came from a wealthy and powerful family. He was well-dressed, proud of his knowledge, free to write home for money when he was at Cambridge University. He had his life all planned out. It would be full and splendid. Then when the important people patronizing him, like King James and others, passed away, his fortunes drastically changed. Later and even today, George Herbert is known not only as an English poet, orator, and priest of the Church of England, but one of the foremost British devotional literature. Um, Lyrics, you know, this English language is still new to me. The writings of Marzia Gale relate the story of Herbert as a sweet breeze. Her words, a nobleman, he turned priest. A calling then in disfavor. He forgot all hopes and desires and spent the days in guiding his congregation towards religious beauty in savoring the countryside around his church at Bedmerton, in listening sometimes to the music in Salisbury Cathedral. And so it was that he became one of the company of the lovers of God, more favored than many lovers, perhaps because he could handle words and he knew how to shape them till they meant what he felt. Love made a saint of him till he must have worn a halo, she writes. Not a painted one, but the kind that shines around one's shadow on bright grass when the sun has just come up. He grew from a somewhat usual brilliant young man furnished with neat verbal virtues to an incarnation of priestliness. But his path was the way of the cross. He grew in pain. He had to struggle every step to beat down his passion for worldly things, to master conflicting desires and doubts, to govern his reluctant consumptive body. He has left us his books to show us the way he went. This reminded me of Mae Maxwell. I think she was a fellow sufferer for the love of God. I use this opportunity to once again repeat Mae Maxwell's quote that I found on the back of a picture of the master's house one day when Rahia Kanum was sorting out her papers. You can't hear it often enough. May Maxwell, who had a consumptive body. The path to God is so narrow that there is only room for one. It is so rough and hard that feet are torn. At times it is so dark 
that the way is hidden. And all times, that which is before us is a cross. Marcia then tells us of those books that Herbert left and speaks of those books thusly. If we remember him, it is because he revolted against contemporary poetry, which he felt to be conventionalized and fabricated and low in aim, because he redirected the love lyric addressed to his Lord. Shall I write and not of thee through whom my fingers bend to hold my quill? Marzia helps us to feel the love that Spencer felt for his God. Would that we could inherit not just his books, but his rapture in loving the creator of all of us. But it is Herbert as lover that we still remember. His passion for God was not an unwavering light, but a wilderness of emotions from agony to joy, from revolt to submission, an adoration still flaming after the lapse of centuries. Sometimes this relationship was intimate, conversational. My God, a verse is not a crown, but it is that which while I use, I am with thee. We learn in this essay of the burdens of the weariness of his consumptive body and the longing to draw near to that voice within his heart. We, we view part of Spencer's evolution in the last paragraph, Marzia's words. Herbert is dust now under the altar of his church at Beamerton. We like to think of this man who forsook a 17th century world for a 17th century heaven, who could leave a court for a village to see in his dying years that his church was struck with boughs and perfumed with incense, and that his farm laborers healed him, I'm sorry, and that his farm laborers made their responses during service, who was lacerated by the love of God until death healed him. You would think that this English lyricist, this unusual poet, had a long life, but he died at 40. And yet during those years, he suffered, as it says here, revolt to submission, adoration for centuries. Our second essay in the second section is for love of God. The second session section is called Take the Gentle Path. So this is the second essay of the second se section for love of God. You may think that this essay was written in the last few years rather than almost a century ago, 1929. The theme is the absence of prayer in contemporary life. It is the first essay in the book, Dawn Over Mount Hera, that directly mentions the Baha'is and then Baha'u'llah. Actually, I'd like to read the entire three plus pages, but I'll settle for sharing a few paragraphs or sentences as example of Marzia's brilliant writing style in respect of what she is conveying. Like Herbert, who could write what he felt, Marzia always writes in respect of what she's telling us. First, Marzia writes how praying has been a norm in people's lives. Prayer was as usual as bread. 
then it lost favor, and Marzia says, our intelligentsia, our intelligentsia assures us that prayer is an aberration, something on the order of talking to oneself. And our fashionables remember that they did not get their little slam when they prayed for it at bridge. And if sorrow forces men to pray, they pray in doubt and desperation, and they take providence with a grain of salt. Then she states how the Baha'is, however, to Baha'is, however, prayer is indispensable and obligatory, and no one is excused therefrom unless he be mentally unsound or an insurmountable obstacle prevent him. This law is great glad tidings, says Marcia Gale. It is one of the most fruitful blessings ever conferred on man. Think of it in that concept when you say your prayers every day. Of course, Marcia <clears throat> was free to be direct as this essay was for an issue of Star of the West, a Baha'i publication. She explains how man searches for something permanent to love, and only God is permanent. Her words. We go through life hitching our wagon to stars that fall, whereupon we are miserable and lasso another one. Our leaves shrivel, our moons wane, the marbles we build our statues of are crumbled. Only God is always strong, always there, always permanent. Only God is worthy to be worked for. Marzia quotes Baha'u'llah telling us to commune with his spirit and the need to know ourselves. She writes, a noted writer, I'm gonna repeat this twice. A noted writer has said that human beings are each on individual islands, shouting to each other across seas of misunderstanding. A noted writer has said that human beings are each on individual islands, shouting to each other across seas of misunderstanding. But prayer is a great simplifier. But prayer is a great simplifier factor and a dispeller of confusion. Through our communion with God, we become explained to ourselves and enable to express our best and truest selves to others. I think Marcia Gale is a philosopher, a spiritual philosopher. You can almost make notes and take directions how to learn to be more spiritual from her insights. The essay, as I read it, soothes the soul burdened by sin. She writes, it is primarily through prayers that human beings may recover from wrongdoings. The essay brings up the question as to, to whom shall we pray? She answers, nations have prayed to the souls of the ancestors, to stones our stars, our sacred cattle. Many of our modern thinkers pray to some exalted figment of their own imagination, which however grandiose in appearance is obviously no more God the creator than is the church artist depiction of some middle-aged gentleman in a pink robe. 
She suggests that we must therefore pray to the attributes of God in their fullest and most clear. We must seek them in his highest creation. We must turn if we seek God to the most perfect man, his manifestation. One of Marzia's closing words reminds me of something Rahir Khanum asked of me during my last visit to the World Center. I'm sorry, my last visit to the World Center while Amitya Baha Rahir Khanum was still alive. But this is Marzia's words. It is not surprising that a prayerless people are driven to drugs and stimulants and a hundred forms of useless activities. They have no antidote for life and no effective means of achieving the respite and nepathy for which they long. It is not surprising that people cheat one another, desert one another, kill one another, because only universal prayer can make the world safer for us to live in. The story that I was reminded of was that last visit I had with Rahia Kano, in which she told me to do something for her. You've heard this before too. She said, Marianne, I want you to ask your non-Baha'i friends if they teach their children how to pray. I suspect, she said, that most of them would say no. Then Marianne, I want you to tell them, do you not think that if your children were drowning, that you would want to throw a lifesaver to help them be saved. That is what prayer is. It's like a lifesaver in the lives of our children and ourselves. Now we're going to section three and into its second essay titled The Same, Headlines Tomorrow. Briefly, I'm not gonna say much about this, Marzia takes the opposite view of a columnist who proclaimed that the biggest scoop of all time would be the news of the return of Christ. Some of you may remember that William Sears, when he was a columnist and he was a sports announcer, later to be named a hand of the cause of God, used the same idea in Thief in the Night. Most of Christians studying the Baha'i faith were introduced to Thief in the Night. But Marzia takes the opposite view. Her stance is, her words, the return of Christ would never make the front page. The return of Christ, she said, in looking at history, and how over and over again, the prophets, messengers, and manifestations of God were not accepted as, shall we say for this theme, newsworthy at the time of their appearance. The essay records the uniqueness of the central figures of today's faith, some of its history, and ends the essay with, these things have not made the front pages today, but they will be in the headlines tomorrow. Section four does the same as section three. The section and the second essay have the same title, Bright Days of the Soul. Marzia shares two topics. The first is the U.S. Congress during the administration of President Arthur, which for your information was 
1881 to 1885. Legislating an American Legation in Persia. She writes a few pages on the first diplomat. One has to look in the notes and reference section of the book to learn that he was Samuel Green Wheeler Benjamin. What you read in those few pages are Wheeler's views of Persia, what he saw where and what he wrote about during his time there. Indeed, Wheeler mentions sites that I myself have seen in a very brief visit to Tehran many years ago. The Peacock Throne, the Shaw's Jewels, including a globe of the world where the oceans are all in sapphire and the various countries in most and more precious gems. I saw chest filled with strings of hundreds of pearls. Marzia thinks that perhaps Wheeler's book, Persia and the Persians, may be the second public mention of the faith of the Bob, Bob in the United States. The first was a letter published in the New York Sun on December 10, 1883. I tried to bring up that particular edition of the New York Sun, but was unsuccessful in being able to read it. Marzia's pen traces what Benjamin saw like slides in a projector. He told of simmering diamond walls covered with hundreds of bits of mirrors like crystal and burnished silver set in floral and geometrical design of soft down, almost flying carpets, of ceilings with carved and tinted crossbeams, of deep panels between them, blue and spangled with golden stars, of wall niches and silver Hubble bubble pipes, of high verandas floating above beds of roses, just bits like slides on a screen. The second topic of this essay is also of the views of Persia. The viewer, however, is on a more meaningful mission through the hills, dales, valleys, cities, and villages of Iran. This journey is recorded in perhaps my favorite chapter of the Dawnbreakers, Nabil's narrative, chapter four, which is titled Mullah Hussein's journey to Tehran. Most of you will know of the Bab's telling Mullah Hussein to travel to four cities, Isfahan, Kashan, Tehran, and Kurdistan, in which one of them enshrines a mystery of such transcendent holiness as neither Hajaz nor Shiraz can hope to rival. Strangely enough, I found a slight variation between the Dawnbreakers and Marzia's narrative in Bright Day of the Soul. And I go on to explain the Bob's four and Marzia's four, and then I say both of them are really correct because of the territory of the Lamb. And in the final analysis, Mullah Hussein went to Isfahan, Kashan, Tehran, where he found the mystery, and Kurdistan. Setting aside that discovery, Marzia describes the journey as if we were following in the footsteps of Mullah Hussein. When I read what Marzia writes, if you are like me, you will have your shoes in his footsteps in the dust and the sand. At the start of his journey, leaving, Tara, uh, uh, leaving Shiraz, Marzia. And that is how Mullah Hussein came to be standing high on the pass there. 
looking backwards across Shiraz. I want you to picture yourself looking back at Shiraz from that hill. Shiraz, the green city of Solomon, to him the jewel box that still held, he knew, the priceless treasure of all on earth, and he had been the first to find it. The road he had traveled ran broad and straight under the great arch down there in which was preserved the Quran that weighs 17 moons. Down to that bridge over the dry river and through the Isfana, Isfahan gate, moons is a weight, 82 pounds, or I got here 1,394 pounds. We're not using the term anymore. Remember, picture yourself following the Bob. She writes, this was the beginning of what the Bob had said. It was time to obey him now, to look away from Shiraz, to put even the Bob out of his mind, if that were possible, because even love could hold him back and go on as he had been instructed to Isfahan. He journeyed forward up the stony road. Marzia's knowledge of Persian history is added to the roots description. He ignored neighborhood Persepolis, which Alexander burned, including the scriptures of Zoroaster, written in golden ink on 12,000 ox skins. He passed uncaring near the Restum picture carvings where lie Darush and other Achaemenian kings. He did not turn aside into that desolate place where once rose a royal city mile on mile for the ruined tomb of Cyrus, of him who 550 years before Jesus Christ conquered the Medes and humbled Babylon. He would have seen there, standing in that emptiness, a rectangular house of stone on a base of giant steps, mosque of the mother of Solomon, the mule tears called it. A tree sprouted from its roof, and only scholars remembered an inscription there once read, O oh man, I am Cyrus, who founded the empire of the Persians and was king of Asia. Grudge me not, therefore, this little earth. Much follows, but we have to go to the next city. Friends, I'm on the last page. So, I hope you haven't fallen asleep. When the time came, he went out, Mullah Hussein, through the city gate, through the poppy fields, past the high cylindrical pigeon towers with their castellated tops, and continued on towards his next city, Kashan. Up and over the long mountain paths he labored, on and down where the miles wound through stone walls, got to orchards and green fields, past the wide half natural lake fit by, built by the kings, went on by a deep depression in the rock that people called the footprint of Ali's horse, saw at last the hundred foot high minaret that first breaks the level of Kashan saw the vaulted roofs of sun-baked bricks. Now you are invited to put on a pair of sandals because Marzia now writes, here at hand was the desert in earnest, sand, salt, and solitude. Here was the boundless waste that stretches to the Eastern frontier. Turn off the two-foot track and be sucked down with your load and camel, lost and blotted out forever, sinking 
strangling in the salt swamps. But this road lay flat beneath the hills along its edge. And he came on into Goom, the blue city with its manufacture of blue tiles and all its blue and greenish domes dwarfed by a golden one. Under this rest Fatima, sister of Iman Reba, the eighth Imam, eighth victim of the split that cracked Islam at the Prophet's death so that the Muslim Caliph murdered the Muslim Imams down through long years. Again, look how much of history Marzia adds to the picture before our mind's eye. Later reaching the goal, Mullah Hussein, the pull of Tehran was stronger than ever, and he passed through the bull blue tiled gate and over the long bridge across the river bed and went on, leaving Goom to drop behind him into the salt swamps. The desert, flecked with salt, lay off on his right to the east. Bare black hills jutted up, knife sharp, and he came to that place they call the Valley of the Angel of Death, a spot of desolate defiles where the mule tears say, monsters appear in the guise of people you love and beckon you away from the caravan to a ghastly death. In Tehran, Mullah Hussein wonders in what house resides the mystery. Most of us know the sequin of what follow. Past friends, students of Sayyid Qasem chastised him as a Judith, a betrayer of their cause, for they did not recognize the Bab as the long awaited Mahdi, did not want to believe that the promised one had indeed come. We know that this incident was overheard by a young student his, who was shocked by his teacher's disrespect of one who was renowned for his knowledge. That young man was the destined instrument to answer the question of Mullah Hussein as to the character of one in Noor whom his soul told him was the mystery. We know of the scroll carried by that youth to the mystery from Mullah Hussein, and of the gifts in return of the loaf of Russian sugar and a package of tea. Marzia writes, waiting back at the college, Mullah Hussein, seeing the messenger return, leapt to his feet, bowing low, he took Baha'u'llah's gift in his trembling hands and raised it to his lips. What could it all mean, the student wondered. He knew that to Mullah Hussein, even gold, silver, and jewels were children's playthings, and this was only sugar and tea. And we know of Mullah Hussein, the Babu Bab's eventual martyrdom, for the twin manifestations of God, that he was uniquely blessed to search out and find. And praise be to God, the name of the mystery, Baha'u'llah, the glory of God, brings out in the world of creation. Thank you, friends, for your patience. I hope it triggers your desire to read entirely those first four sections.